Hello, everybody. I am Lara Muccio, the host of the Food Freedom Summit. And today we're here with Vera Tarman. So hi, Vera, welcome to the summit. And, hi there. <laughs> and thank you for being here. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What has been your recovery story? And how come you, you wrote a book, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction? My story is, um, my story and my professional life, they kind of go hand in hand. So I, like so many people um, in so many young women uh, in university, I was really um, concerned about my weight. And of course, at the time, now when I look back, I, I, I think, how, how could I have been worried? My weight was fine. Um, but I thought I was too much weight. And, and like so many people um, in, in that age group, I thought I had to start dieting and changing my food and whatnot. And although I don't think I ate up too obsessively, I always liked sugar, of course, when I was a child. Um, I don't think I actually ate obsessively in the way that I hear people talk about it now, where some people will describe, you know, stealing their food uh, from the, you know, the family pantry, you know, in their, in their, like when they were eight years old or something like that, that didn't happen to me. I always knew I liked sugar, but you know, that, that was, so what I, I, I liked a lot of things, uh, but anyway, in my teens, um, or actually in my early twenties, I started to try to go on a really, really restricted weight uh, plan, like down to 800 calories a day or something like that. And uh, what ended up happening is, is I became really obsessed about eating and weight, which is of course what happens when you do that. Um, I, I don't see that I'm unusual in this way. Uh, and um, I'll, and I, I'm going to attribute the fact that I have a family history of alcoholism and you know my own issues with alcohol before that kind of primed me. But what I ended up um, happening was in university, I had to stop behaving uh, the way I was with alcohol because I wanted to go to school and do well. Um, that food became uh, something that was just astoundingly, um, uh, overwhelmingly uh, important in my mental landscape, in my mind. It was either what could I eat? It was um, uh, uh, what should I exercise to get off what I've eaten? Um, it was foods that I would be thinking about later or that eating now and thinking about later. I mean, it was just dominating my landscape. Um, and so I tried to, um, ever since then I struggled and the more I struggled, the bigger the struggle became. And this was in the seventies and eighties when uh, the concept of, of um, eating disorders was just starting to be um, out there in the uh, sort of clinical world. Uh, so I uh, approached people like in the emergency and doctors to say, you know, what's wrong with me? Because all I can think about is eating. I mean, I could do my work, but it was like, it was like um, having to move blinds aside, all these thoughts about food, push them aside to be able to get to my work. I couldn't just sit there and not think about food. Um, and uh, I, I, although they kind of put, put up their hands and said, I don't know either. Um, now I think I would probably have been labeled as a bulimic because I learned how to, uh, in a way I could eat it the way I wanted to is by throwing it up so that there'd be more room to eat again. And I developed that lifestyle for many years. And uh, you know I became a, a doctor, a family doctor and uh, my weight increased. And there I am telling people who have diabetes, you've got to lose weight. And there I was, you know, 100 pounds more than I am now, um, feeling really embarrassed sort of aware of the fact that I was, I guess, hypocritical about my advice because I wasn't following the advice of trying to lose weight. I was still binging at night, um, uh, trying to manage my food behavior. And when I got into addiction medicine, which became my specialty, um, that would be now maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I don't know, time goes so quickly now. Um, I started to see the connection um, because the, the literature that exists today didn't exist then. So this was all new. To me and you know the various people who have been in the field we weren't talking to each other then that's happening now but not then so this was all new to me and i just started to see that my behavior with food was so much like the co cocaine and alcoholics and and uh you know i'd already um been a smoker and quit smoking and i knew from that experience that the only way to not smoke again was to don't ever have a puff. Don't pick up. Don't borrow from somebody else. Don't say, can I have a cigarette and still call yourself a non-smoker? I knew that you just had to stop, stop, stop. And so I eventually um, 
realized I have to do that with food, specifically sugar at that time. That was the main trigger. And then it worked. Like I, that, that all those thoughts that were um, obsessing me really, really quietened like instead of a 10 out of 10 it went down to a four out of 10 which is still a lot but it was way better um and it was better enough that i thought okay that i've got it now so i can reintroduce sugar because who wants to not be able to eat an ice cream on a hot day um especially a nice italian one you know like it's how how, how can you not want a nice treat on a hot day. And so then that would always reintroduce the, the trigger and all those thoughts again. And so I eventually got the idea after a number of years, I'd say now probably 15 years ago, that you have to stop no matter what and stay stopped. And that was the beginning of my professional career because, um, so there I am a, a family doctor now moving into addiction medicine using this personal plan of my sugar as a uh, addiction platform. And then when I started to tell people like patients and other colleagues, uh, they would just, uh, I would feel, I don't know, uh, it, it was, it was such an unusual thought then it's becoming more uh, well known now, but then it was very unusual. And people would just say, don't be silly. You're just being the usual you, you take things too far, you, you know, you go too crazy. Don't be silly. And, and uh, I would get cowed and, and I guess silenced. So I finally thought I have to write something. Well, actually people told me, Vera, you've got the credentials to say something, use them, you know, the, the MD status and now an addiction doctor status, but you have to write a book. And um, uh, because a book will uh, give you more credibility than just, uh, you know, being a professional in the field. Uh, because again, remember, this is a long time ago. Um, and I didn't really want it. Writing a book is not easy. It's, it's, it's a serious undertaking. Um, and I became convinced after a number of times that I would go and speak, you know, I'd go to the library and say, let me talk about this subject, thinking I'd get a overflowing room full of people who are struggling with their weight, wanting to hear what Dr. Vera Tarman said. Five or six people would show up, maybe eight if I was lucky. And it was like, come on. So get a book. And so I, I, I um, um, eventually took on the task. It took about a year to two uh, to collect uh, information from various colleagues and my own story and um, patient stories to write this book. And indeed, it made a big difference. Uh, a book really does make a difference because it speaks when you can't go somewhere and speak. Um, and so that sort of started my uh, professional world of uh, speaking about food addiction, which has become a passion outside of my work. Um, and so probably for the last 10 or almost 15 years, I've been speaking about the subject. Um, I'm not a pioneer in the food addiction field. There are people before me, but I would say I'm the next generation of those early people. Now there are, you mentioned a few people, uh, the, sugar, the global sugar RX, that's the next generation after me. And they've come from um, my generation teaching them. So I'm really happy to see the, and you're interviewing a lot of those people. I'm really happy to see that they're getting their feet in, uh, in a sense, spreading the message further. And the more we have people like them and um, uh, others, others in my quote generation talking about clinical experience, then there's gonna be more science and then people will start taking it more seriously. But for people who are listening um, and are new to this whole area, you might be thinking, intuitively it makes sense to be addicted to sugar but where's the science where why is it that the the professional world is not adopting this it has to be the naturopaths and the and the dietitians who are willing to stand out of the norm who take that stand and uh there's not that many who are willing to do that like people like you Lara, who are doing a podcast it's still not that many in the larger scheme of things talking about this this issue and it's because we're just at the cusp of, I guess it's called the uh, tipping point, where people are acknowledging, yes, their sugar is addictive. And the next step, there's actually more than just sugar addiction. There's actually a phenomena called food addiction. And that's uh, um, where many of us are speaking, because we're talking about more than just sugar addiction. We're talking about something happens to the brain permanently. So that once, once that happens, just like the alcoholic or the cocaine addict, or the, even the smoker. Once you're a smoker and you quit, you can't just have a few. You're, you're now a smoker forever, but you're in remission, you're in recovery. Um, and that means you're not gonna have it anymore. And that's sort of where we are today. 
Wow, there. thank you so much. Yeah, it makes so much sense. <laughs> so much sense now to um, like we are in the phase in which the awareness is coming out and we have to go for, forward. Yes. So what would you say to someone that um, might have this attachment to food or to sugar in particular, and they don't know exactly how to go about it? They, they might even don't really want to consider the fact of having an, an addiction. Yeah, you know, it, the, the concept of addiction still frightens people um, and because it still has the stigma of somebody who's either, you know, in the park, uh, you know, you, you know, with with almost no clothes on kind of crazy using the last of their rent money to get their cocaine or crack or crystal meth. I'm using that example because I live across the street from a park and I see it all the time. And so that's, you know, that's an addict and that's not me uh, or, you know, the alcoholic who's, um, you know, got cirrhosis and is you know so sick and yet they still can't stop drinking those are extreme ends of uh, of the addiction paradigm um and in food addiction we have the same kind of uh, extreme end i mean that's the people that are like the world's biggest loser like that show the people who are 400 500 pounds and sure they can lose weight if they go on like a, a no calorie diet and are doing mega exercise but the moment that you can't live that life forever and the moment you stop your, you know, your, your weight um, goes right back up and higher. And, you know, so these are the people who are 400, 500 pounds, even 300 pounds, and are so embarrassed or so immobile, so disabled by their weight that they can't even go outside anymore. So we don't see them in the park. We don't see them in the hospitals. There's a, the hospital beds won't fit them. They won't even go to the hospital. Um, uh, and so they're by themselves up, upstairs or downstairs in a basement and stuck having to call in their food like the alcoholic calls in their booze. Um, so those people exist, but there's a whole continuum um, of, of people who are struggling with food out there in the world. And we don't want to say that we're addicts, but you know, if you are listening and you realize that you struggle with food in the way that you know, well, I've reached a weight that I'm not comfortable with and I really should stop. Most people know what foods are causing the trouble. I mean, it's not the Brussels sprouts and the lettuce. It's the, it's the, uh, the potato chips or the, and the ice cream and the whatever it is. And, and um, most people will know that they have a little bit and they should only have a little bit, but they just isn't enough. See, and the moment you start to try to curb it, because the desire is there that you want more than just a couple of chips or a couple of, uh, you know, a small ice cream, forget it, that's only a taste, that's only the appetizer, now I want the whole thing. Um, that, that's an addictive pull right there. And, and the moment you're struggling with that, you have some level of addiction, it might be mild, but it's some level. And the importance of that is if you continue that food and continue that struggle, um, then it, that, that it, it, addiction is chronic and progressive, no matter what it is, it will just get worse. It might not get worse tomorrow, but it will get worse eventually. So the best thing to do is get off the bus, get off the addiction early before it becomes too demanding. Um, and the simple way to do that is just to re recognize what are the foods, sugar is almost always number one, but it can be, it can be uh, flour. A lot of people, it's flour, uh, you know, like, like uh, um, you know, bread, the breads, the buns, the, the, the pastas, it can be that. And uh, once you recognize, if I'm not only able to have a little bit, but I want a little bit more, that has to get taken off off the uh, uh, off the um, uh, menu, and then you end up having peace because when you eat the Brussels sprouts, which are delicious if you prepare them properly, you, you you don't want more of those. Most people don't want more of those, even in middle stage addiction, they don't want more. So they they eat until they're full, and then they are done. They can push the plate away without that little voice saying, "Have a little bit more," which happens with the pasta and the buns and the ice cream and the whatnot. So you actually live a place of uh, peace. Um, once you get rid of these things, but it does involve identifying that there's an addiction and people don't like that word. Um, but if I can just suggest that in today's society, 2020, uh, uh, two, 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 2022, um, that and onwards, uh, that most of us are addicted to something because we live in an environment where there is too much of everything and people are the, 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 the um, industrial uh, complex which involves food now you mentioned earlier it's not just food it's anything so internet sex um uh 
I don't know, everywhere. Uh, I mean, basically the industry is wanting you to purchase uh, and they have to compete with other people. So they're going to make things extra hard to not take, use, which means they're fi trying to find ways to make things addictive. So we're living in, an society, in a society where unless you're off the, off the grill, like you're literally in a tent somewhere unplugged, um, you are um, uh, having constant attempts to make you addicted to something. So we have to get rid of this word because 95% of us are at some level addicted to something, shopping, um, uh, watching TV, our, our iPhone, our food, uh, cigarettes, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. So let's get rid of that word. We should actually claim it. Uh, and uh, as, I mean, just in the, in the same way that we now no longer are embarrassed to say, you know, that we're depressed or that we're anxious. I mean, there's still a bit of stigma, but much less. We have to do the same thing with addiction. Just say, I'm addicted to this. Uh, if you want to use another word, we'll use another word. It doesn't matter. It's recognizing this phenomenon in the brain that's changing and then being able to address it without shame. That's great. Like the addressing it without shame is, yes. is very good. Um, and it's one of the things that has been present in all the interviews that I had with people that were talking about food addiction and sugar addiction. Yeah. The fact that um, it's not a moral issue is, is something happened to your brain. So can you explain a little bit what happens to the brain? Yeah. So, you know, like when people talk about shame and they think about food, um, you know, one, one of the things that we ask, uh, I'm sure some of your speakers have talked about how you identify if you're a food addict, like the criteria. And one of the criteria is, do you eat differently in private versus in public? So in public, you use your fork and you, you know, you eat nicely and you only eat so much and you don't sort of pig out and eat all this other stuff. But when you're private, it's like, oh, who cares about the fork? I'll just eat with my hand and I'll just eat as much as I want. And, and, and sometimes it'll get to the point where uh, I, um, uh, like the, the embarrassment that the, the kinds of behaviors that people uh, do is they they're there and I remember myself feeling so ashamed I think I can't believe I'm doing this eating this way the amounts that I'm eating throwing up like 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 it's very embarrassing and so to tell somebody else that there's a lot of shame uh, you know food it's a bit like sex in that way it's it's so primal it's so uh, necessary to us and and um it's not something you can push away. So we all have an intimate relationship somewhat with it. So when it's something a little bit off, we feel a lot of shame. Um, and so I, I would say that uh, it, there doesn't even have to be pathology around this. It's just because it's so intimate and that there's something unusual and we don't talk about it. Like, like I say, if I'm eating out in public when I was like in the food, like food addicted, um, I would be very careful to eat properly so nobody would know. The only way they'd know something was wrong was that my weight was really high. Um, but uh, if they saw the way I ate, like I said, that there, there would be that shame there and the embarrassment to talk about that. Like, you can't tell your doctor, well, I eat food. I don't even know whose food it is. It was there on the, at the restaurant and I just grabbed it because it looked good. Like that kind of stuff is, is uh, not something you want to tell a professional or your friend or your mother. Um, so we have to get rid of that shame. But uh, once you get further in the development of the addiction, um, I imagine how full of shame a person feels when they're 400 pounds or 300 and they can't even get out of bed to go down the stairs like in, in my book I have a story of a, a guy who was so big that he was worried about getting a heart attack rightly so but he was too embarrassed to have a doctor come and see him like a house doctor or uh, to go he couldn't even get out downstairs to get to uh, a doctor's office and would be too embarrassed to call a, a cab or something like that so um, uh, anyway there's that but once you get to that level so there's the extra shame of, of the, the complications. What about somebody who's got severe diabetes and all they do is get scolded by their doctor because they're saying, why are you eating like that when you've got diabetes? And they're saying, I don't know why I'm eating like that, but they don't want to say that, like that shame piece. Um, when the addiction gets more and more gripped in your brain, that ability to say no, which everybody wants to say, even the person who's just having a little bit of a, a, you know, a couple of cookies and now says they, well, maybe I'll have a few more. They really wish they could say no, but it's not that big a deal because it's early stage and maybe they can say no. But 
oh, as the addiction continues, the saying no becomes harder and harder because the part of the brain that basically says, yes, I want it all, that's the addiction. And the addiction manifests itself as a big, yes, I want it all. And that little no, which is in the frontal lobe, it's in a different part of the brain. It's trying to say, no, Vera, you, got, you, you have to stop because you've already, uh, you know, gone 20 pounds more than you said you were that was okay you know you're already pre-diabetic now and you're going to become diabetic please no uh, that no is just not powerful enough because it's in a part of the brain that has uh, much less power even in good days and on a bad day when the addiction is really really strong it's a bit like uh, you know you're you're fighting two parts of your brain and one is just super powerful and it will always win over the other always willpower is just simply not enough and if you adopt the addiction paradigm not just the willpower moral paradigm which is the, the standard one um you'll know if i want to quit this i can my willpower will get me in the door to listen to a podcast to call a coach to call a nutritionist to call somebody because you don't really want to but the willpower will force you to do to do that and then when it runs out then you've got the help that's going to help you through um i i'm a believer that we need help because our our brain the the, the conscious controlling rational adult side of our brain the intuitive side of our brain is um over it's dwarfed by the addiction that's basically a, it's a good word it's dwarfed the addiction is too big so i need a coach i need a counselor i need a 12-step group i need something on my side to face this essentially this monster inside of me which we call addiction wow that's that's wow that's really <laughs> really interesting and and so how once we start this process of getting help and then having the help when we actually need it and when our willpower is when we have bad days and our willpower is already depleted on, yes. on other things that happen to, uh, to us uh, in our lives so how can we what happens so is there a way to reverse all all this damage that has been done to the to the brain is there hope is there a way to oh, yeah. manage everything? Yes. yes. So, so you know, it's it's a, a good question. Is there hope? Absolutely, there's hope. And and those of us in the addiction field will say there's lots of uh, approaches out there to work, and they all work. Um, uh, but if you have an addiction, you have to add the addiction piece on top of it. So it's not enough to just do intuitive eating and cognitive therapy and mindfulness and all these things and good sleep. These are all very good, but they're not enough. You have to have this addiction uh, uh, approach as well. And the addiction approach is to say that um, this is, like you rightly said, there is, uh, if you want to call it damage, I would prefer to just say a permanent change, a permanent adaptation, a permanent neurological adaptation to an environment of over consumptive food, like, you know, the foods of today. We don't become addicted to stuff, stuff that you know, people ate 300 years ago, because it didn't, this stuff didn't exist then. And, and so food addiction didn't exist the way it does now. It's because of the foods. And it's our adaptation to that, you get too much of something. Um, and uh, uh, the brain adapts, and it adapts by making you tolerant. And then um, it, it literally tries to change to adapt to this new environment. And that change is permanent. So uh, once you recognize I can't eat sugar, because if I have a little bit, I just want more that might not have been the case for you 30 years ago like for myself as when i was younger i i have to admit i don't i didn't suffer uh in the way that i see some people do now and i think they are suffering because probably they started younger than i did like the foods of today are available to babies that were not available to me i mean i was breastfed by my mother and and uh but the the kids of today or the babies of today are breastfed by by formula that's full of sugar I, I, mean, I don't know if it all of it is but some of it is and then they're given cereal which is like that stuff so it, it kind of pushes the addiction earlier earlier early which is exactly what we're seeing in fact we're even worried now that people can become predisposed because if mom is eating too many uh, cookies and chips and whatnot in vitro baby is already um, having to adapt to those changes so um uh Anyway, the neural adaptation happens at some point, but you know, at, at some point you weren't that way, but it happens and then now you are. 
And so if you adopt this addiction framework, you can say, I'm not cured, I'm not gonna ever be done, but I'm somebody who used to be able to eat sugar, but I can't anymore. And I just have to accept that just like those of you who have a cigarette once in a while, but have never been a smoker can probably do that forever once in a while, you know, when you're out standing with your friends who are smoking because they have to. Uh, but once you become one that has to, you're not going to become a once in a while person. And I know there are some people who are going to say, wait a minute, that's me, but they're very few. They're very few. Most of us, once we've gotten into an addiction, we can't just have a little bit. There is no alcoholic that I know. Well, okay, I can't say that. There are some, but most that the, the, the general majority have to stop completely. And similarly with food, uh, sugar. So if you recognize it's never going to go away, but I can manage it. I can make it so that it doesn't dominate. Like I was saying before, all those thoughts that just, they were with me like a bad smell all the time. Um, now, uh, because I don't introduce them by having a little bit here and there, um, it, they, don't, they don't bother me at all. At the most on a bad day, instead of a 10 out of 10, on a bad day, it might be a three out of 10. And that'll just be like, ah, my Starbucks and I can't have one of those things that those people have. That's only, that's, that's I'm being grumpy. Uh, most of the time I don't want the stuff at Starbucks because I just think, oh my God, that would make me feel so tired and so sick. I'm grateful. So th the good news is that, um, I guess the bad news is it never goes away, but you can manage it. But the good news is you can find, you can live happily without that stuff because in fact, our body was made to not live with that stuff. I mean, we're at a, at adapting to a bad food environment. If you start eating good food, your, your body will actually thrive. You're actually gonna feel great. Like, you know, I eat and I'm, I, I, I'm not tired after I've eaten. How many people are tired after they've eaten? You're supposed to feel energetic or, or you know, I'm ready to go now. Um, uh, and you won't be obsessed about food. Your weight will go to the weight that it should be. It might not be cosmetically where you want it to be. If you want to be, you know, very thin, uh, it's not going to do that. But you'll be at the weight you should be. Your metabolic, uh, your health conditions will resolve themselves. You'll be at the, the eating the food that you should be eating and thriving at. So the good news is, if you if you follow an addiction model, because the foods that we're eating are addictive that tells you get rid of them, you'll actually get back to the set point of uh, body happiness. I don't know if that's a term um, that you should be. And it's actually a very happy place. And, and it's not, it's a non-craving place. And I guess the final good news about this is that all of that whole process will only take three or four weeks. We're not talking years, we're talking weeks. Um, the, the thing that makes it years is that because you've developed a change, you're always thinking, yeah, but I like that sugar. Or, you know, I remember when I was unhappy and a bottle of wine would just make me feel chill. Like you'll, you'll be living with a memory that, uh, uh, and all sorts of cues, like people telling you, uh, you know, you're fine, have a little bit of something. To live a life in recovery is a struggle, but it's not a struggle because you want the food. It's because you're trying to maintain um, uh, both your own internal messages that say you should be able to eat that stuff and also the external messages. And that's where um, coaching and uh, uh, mindfulness and all that stuff, that's when that stuff works. It's not how to get clean, it's how to stay clean. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. And like community is also very important yes. because if Absolutely. the people around you are like they bought into like everything that society and like idea of retirement yes. and everything is telling us to do to eat to drink whatever then you tend to kind of like go with the group because we're social people <laughs> social exactly. animals we're social people and we we will believe what we hear like it's true uh, even me and here I am talking all the time I've written this book if I if I wasn't uh, involved in a in a social connection that tells me that this is the right thing for me I'm going to think uh, I'm going to think you know what why can't I do that they did that like it just happens yeah. we are susceptible to each other and one of the things that I really like about what you were talking about is there's no shame in in having those thoughts and and having those feelings because it's it's totally normal and the maintain, yeah. maintaining the craving management the um the staying clean <laughs> let's say mm -hmm. that's the the whole point so having a community around you having a coach having someone that 
you can just pick up the phone or, or write an email or a message, whatever that is, and just have like, yes, don't worry, <laughs> we will yes. manage it. Uh, and then having all the tools to manage um, everything, that's, that's really what, what can really change things for you. Uh, and so we, I was curious, is there a difference between sugar addiction and food addiction? Yeah, so I, I you know, the, the, this is an area that in the research where we're trying to make this a condition that should be, um, you know, funded by insurance, you know, to get it into the DSM-5, um, you know, we need to have the good solid research. And one of the places where the research um, gets stalled um, is that we, and also the whole idea of getting this condition acknowledged is what should we call it? Should we call it sugar addiction? Should we call it processed food addiction? I think most people like the processed food addiction. Probably if we did a poll, that would get the most numbers, the processed food addiction. But I actually like even just using the term, the very generic term, food addiction, which is very broad. And people will say, but you can't be addicted to food. You have to, you have to eat. And, and it's true. Um, but um, what it does is it makes it an umbrella term so that sugar is obviously food. It's one, well, you could say it's not really food. It's a food product. It's a, it's a part of food. It's not food in and of itself, which is part of the problem. But anyway, um, you know, the sugar is part of it, but there's an umbrella which includes flour. It includes grain. It includes fruit or maybe not all fruit, but some fruits. It includes uh, sweeteners, it includes dairy, um, uh, it, nuts. It includes many things that are addictive to some people, but not others. Um, so that uh, sugar is almost universal. It's, it's a given, a, a shoe in We can start with that one. And then flour, which is basically a refined carbohydrate that's almost sugar, is almost next in line. Almost everybody has some level of, uh, of uh, maybe not addiction, but an addictive impulse. It's harder to have just a little bit. You just have, you know, you, 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 you always want a little bit more, um, but it might not be to the point of disease or disorder but it's still there that you're aware of that kind of tension as it were but anyway so so but as the condition progresses remember this is a chronic progressive condition it seems to be that more things become triggering um and they don't even have to be food related so with addiction we understand it's the drug in other words the food in this case but it's also the behaviors associated with it like i go to a movie and i need to have my popcorn with the movie and i have to tell you i was an avid movie goer when i was eating junk food all the time i would go to a movie at least twice a week if i could and i would get those big things of popcorn and then i would ur urge my my friend who was with me to get one and you know she'd say but i don't eat that much popcorn. i said it doesn't matter i'll eat yours um I, I mean, it was, it, I realized when I stopped and I had to cut the popcorn out, I didn't want to go to movies anymore because what was the point? I mean, now I go, but not as much. Um, the, the association of going to a movie made me want the popcorn. And, um, it, you know, Christmas time, there's all sorts of, uh, or, or any kind of holiday time, uh, cues, uh, people, places, things we call it that make you want to eat food. And uh, so it doesn't even have to be food itself, but it's behaviors around it that fit in this umbrella term um, that you want to address. And then it's even the way a person eats. So some people um, will say, I can, I, I, I'm not addicted to Brussels sprouts, but I am addicted to being full. And I'm addicted to eating, just chewing and eating. And you know, if you say, how are you addicted to that? If it's, if it's um, an obsession where that's, the thoughts are all over your head, that's all you can think about. If it's causing damage to you, um, if, it's, if it's, you can't control the amount, um, you know, so the, to the point where you eat so you, you're so full because you want that feeling, it still fulfills the criteria of addiction. So when you use the word food addiction, it's a broader um, uh, picture because I see people if they don't get off the bus, that's what we say, you get off the bus before the end destination, uh, then you'll start adapting some of these things. Um, and so then your problems later are worse than they were before, unless you get help, and then you can stop the bus right where it is. <laughs> that's the goal. Nice. <laughs> I like that. Just press stop. And like, nope, yes. I, I won't get off. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for like having, having it like so clear for everybody, because I think it's, it's really important. And I think since we're about time, can you tell us a little bit about your free gift for, for the audience? 
uh, that is the free lecture on food addiction, War of the Hunger Hormones. Yes, yes, okay. Sounds really interesting. <laughs> yes, so so th this is something that I um, I did. Um, it, it's an actual live lecture that I did, and I really liked it, so I, I uh, bought um, somebody to tape it, and I just use it for this sort of thing. Um, it, it explains, uh, I've got my book, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Uh, this is like a video that shows the PowerPoint um, breakdown of some of that stuff sort of in an hour and a half. So you, you don't have to read the book, although I think the book is worth reading. Um, it, it kind of explains it in a lecture format, the different, the different um, uh, understanding. I actually use it a lot for people who are in training to be food addiction counselors. Um, it, it explains the hormonal aspects so that people who do keto and, and paleo, why that works. And they are not food addicts, but they're eating addictive food that they're now stopping. So it explains a sort of normal response to the food environment. And then it explains the progression to the next response, which, which is the addiction itself. Uh, so that's what that lecture is. And then I also have uh, my book, uh, food junkies um uh, and then um if i if, if i can say um i invite people please if they want to if they're interested in this um i have a free uh, facebook page called i'm sweet enough sugar free for life that um, people can join if they're already in in recovery and they need to have that bubble of uh, people around them that support them or people who are new and want to get started and on there i have um like podcasts, like when this one is uh, aired, I will uh, um, bring, put it in there. Um, uh, and um, um, when people uh, are coaches and whatnot, um, I will have a list of uh, coaches and groups and stuff like that. So it's a good resource hub as well for food addiction. Yes, thank you so much. So that if you guys don't know where to start, then the Facebook group is probably- um, Yes. A very good resource to just go and um, and start to be surrounded by a community that understands exactly. you, understands what what's going on in your life, and they've probably already walked the path. They they got off the bus, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they can help you like stop the bus and be like the bottom is there. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, it, it's, it's actually a really nice combination of newcomers and old, like uh, people who have been around the block a few times, on the bus a few times and gotten off <laughs> and helping each other. So it's a really, it is a really nice support group in that way. Yeah, thank you for letting me mention that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I thank you so much. And I, um, the reason why I'm doing all of this and I'm setting up the Food Freedom Summit is because I want people to be free, whether it's from a specific food, whether it's from like a specific addiction or just having the freedom of choosing foods that are supporting their health instead of just going for, for like the, the pressure, the social pressure, the pressure from advertisement yeah. and everything. This is the reason why. And so this is a completely free event, but if, um, if the audience wants to have um, access for lifetime to Vera's interview and all the other interviews of this summit, you can upgrade to VIP and get all the all the fantastic um, gifts and bonuses that are there, the recordings of this summit, my previous summit. And also there are still some fast, fast uh, action bonuses uh, probably there for you. Uh, and also 50% of the earnings from um, the VIP upgrade are going to be donated to the Noakes Foundation. So the Noakes Foundation is a South African mm -hmm. organization that is working towards changing the food mandates in South Africa and educating the world on what real nutrition is <laughs> and what we should be eating and everything that Vera talked about, uh, like all these new foods, the fact that sugar is not even a real food, it's just a food product. And mm -hmm. that's part of the problem. So they're trying to help uh, South Africa changed the the type of food that is actually available for people out there because part of the problem is the fact that we're flooded with food like products that are very very addictive uh, and they're not really um, working in in our in our favor and for our health. Uh, so if you want to make a change and help them in this and also get all the interviews and everything, consider upgrading to VIP. And thank you so much, Vera. And as just a last quick question, if someone had to take away just one thing from everything we've discussed today, 
what would that be? Um, okay, well, that thank you. That allows me to leave this message with a message of hope. But can I just say quickly about your VIP that, yeah. I, that as far as the food addiction people that you interviewed, you got some really good people, like some really good heavy hitters in the field. So it is really worth listening to what they had to say, along with me too. <laughs> um, but, so what I would say in terms of a message of hope is that if you feel daunted by the idea of, oh my God, I can't have that favorite food, um, uh, it is part of the addictive pull that makes you feel that way. And once that breaks, which only takes a few weeks, like it doesn't take that long, sometimes even 10 days, sometimes even less. Uh, and uh, if you struggle, take the, make the expense, it's worth the expense to get a coach, to get something, to get help, like, like to be a, become a VIP person. It, it's worth the expense to just get through that. And then once you're through um, the freedom, uh, is is amazing. Like it's not like you're going to be feeling deprived the rest of your life. You won't. You'll be feeling relieved. It'll be a feeling of relief. And then the, the trick then is just to not get caught back into picking it up again. But it's not. It, it's a it's a message of freedom from obsession, a relief, not not of feeling deprived by no means. I just want people to know that it's it's actually a very hopeful message. Yes, I am so happy you you mentioned that. That that is the whole point. That's helping people to get free from whatever it is that yeah, food freedom is. yeah <laughs> that that's the whole point behind yeah freedom is one of the values that i value <laughs> most pun yeah. intended uh in my life so this is the gift that we're trying to give you all um by speaking about everything food <laughs> in here thank you so much dr Vera, for being here